Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 63rd episode of the Exploring Antinatalism podcast, a podcast all about the subject of antinatalism created by antinatalists. My name is Amanda Oldfan Sukunik, formerly known as Forever Wolf Films on YouTube. And I'm Matt, also known as Life Sucks on YouTube, and I'll be your co host for today's episode. I'm an antinatalist and effortless YouTuber and artist, and author of the recent The ABCs of Antinatalism Coloring Book, The Ethics of Procreation from A to Z. And today we're speaking with the head of the Department of Philosophy at the University of Liverpool, author of many books, including The Things That Really Matter, Philosophical Conversations on the Cornerstones of Life, and co-editor of volume 56 of the Journal of Value Inquiry, a special issue entitled, Would It Be Better If We Had Never Existed? David Benatar's Antinatalism featuring nine articles, including his own, Antinatalism, Pollyannaism, and Asymmetry, A Defense of Cheery Optimism. Michael Hauskeller. A quick note before we begin, around the 37 minute mark, you will notice that this episode actually represents two different recording sessions. In our first attempt, we got more than halfway through the questions, only then to realize that in fact, nothing had been recorded, an absolute tragedy of an event that I must take full responsibility for. Uh, my deepest apologies again to both Professor Housekeller and Matt once again for this, um, and a huge thank you to both of them for soldiering on and agreeing to do a re-recording. It was a great pleasure for me to work with both of them in the production of this episode, and I so hope that they um, enjoy the way it came out, as well as uh, I so hope uh, that our audience enjoys the way it came out as well. Uh, thank you so much to everyone. Welcome to the Exploring Antinatalism podcast, Mr. Housekeller. Oh, hello. <laughs> hello, Amanda. Hello, Matt. Hello. It's wonderful to have you with us. Uh, and a warm welcome back to our special go uh, guest host as well for this episode. Life sucks. How are you today, Matt? Good. Thank you for having me again. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Housekeller, thank you so much for being our guest today on Exploring Antinatalism. It's our great pleasure to have you with us. Uh, Michael, despite the fact that you are not an antinatalist, you have, in fact, done some really important work in generating content around the subject uh, through your involvement in the creation of volume 56 of the Journal of Value Inquiry. And we love seeing that. We love seeing people you know, uh, create content, whether they're an antinatalist or not. And in addition to this, you've written quite a lot of about transhumanism, which is a subject that increasingly seems to be at odds with antinatalism in various ways. Um, and so we think conversations between antinatalists and transhumanists is um, really of the utmost importance because they, you know, they both, both camps have ideas about what the future is gonna be. And uh, that argument is, is really important to have, I think. Um, so much we are so excited to get into, uh, into uh, with you today. But before we do um, a few standard questions that we, uh, I ask every episode, so let's begin with. So in your own words, who is Michael Hauskeller? Uh, yeah, I wish I knew. Uh, <laughs> I suppose I'm a philosopher by profession, but that doesn't necessarily make me what I am. Um, that is to say, I don't think I've been destined to become a philosopher. It just happened somehow. Uh, I guess that most people would tag me as an ethicist, but if I am one, then I'm not a a conventional one in a sense that I'm not so much interested in what is right and wrong and how we can um, justify uh, or explain what makes things wrong and right, but rather in a broader sense, I'm interested in, in what makes life good and what we're here for or what ought we to do with our lives, right? And uh, I don't know, I grew up and studied in Germany um, at the University of Bonn, where uh, we studied mostly Kant and German idealism, Schelling, Hegel, Fichte, those kind of guys. Uh, and I came to England 20 years ago, and today I would probably regard myself um, as a British philosopher rather than a German philosopher. And in terms of my work, I've done many things but uh, in recent years, past decade, I would say, uh, I've done a lot of work on human enhancement and transhumanism, as you already said, Amanda. Uh, and lately, uh, I've become very much interested in meaning, not necessarily meaning of life, but meaning in life. That is what constitutes a meaningful life. You have quite a prolific uh, publishing history. I mean, so many books, so many papers, really quite quite a, uh, an extraordinary amount of work. Um, can you tell us a little a bit about your history as a writer? Hmm. Um, well, it's probably that I have 
many different interests. So uh, I write about something and then uh, something else catches my interest. So I have to write about that too. Uh, the first book I, I published was actually on Alfred North Whitehead in 1994, which was based on my MA thesis. Um, and then I followed this with my PhD thesis, which was something completely different, namely a phenological um, investigation into the phenomenon of atmospheres, uh, which was based mostly on, on uh, German phenological tradition, people like Ludwig Klades and Hermann Schmitz and my own PhD supervisor and teacher Gernot Böhm at the time. And then after that, I uh, did a book on art, what is art, uh, then what is beauty, uh, then I did a history of ethics, uh, and then finally, uh, still in Germany, an essay on the foundations of ethics, uh, in which I looked at the aesthetic roots or perceptual roots of moral intuitions and judgments, because for me, there's a connection between the ethical and the the aesthetic. So that also explains my interest in, in beauty. So there's an ethical dimension to our experience of beauty and the other way around. Levinas, Emmanuel Levinas once said, ethics is an optics. And I think that that, that is true. And then I came to England, as I said, 20 years ago. And it was a steep le learning curve for me because suddenly I had to publish in English. And uh, <laughs> so far, until then, I only had published in, in German, so I wasn't uh, used to it. So it took me a while. And then I published a book on biotechnology and the integrity of life. And then a series of books on human enhancement and transhumanism. And most recently, um, because I then became interested in the meaning meaning in life question, a book on the meaning of life and death, which looks into 10 um, well-known philosophers and writers and looks at their work, which centers very much on that, that question of the meaning, meaning in life and how this is affected by our experience or knowledge of our own mortality. And um, most recently, a couple of months ago, published another book called The Things That really matter, uh, which is a series of conversations I've had with various uh, philosophers on fundamental things in life, such as death, beauty, goodness, um, all kinds of other things. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, in your introduction piece for the special antinatalism edition of the Journal of Value Inquiry, you say that antinatalism uh, has been regarded as by most philosophers as, quote, repulsive and offending, end quote, uh, as it, quote, runs counter to our pro-life intuitions. Uh, you've also described Benatar's view as, quote, seemingly, seemingly absurd. Um, so I'm curious, how did you come to discover um, David Benatar's work and antinatalism, and why did you choose to write about the topic, uh, despite being opposed to it? Well, I'm not, I'm not really saying that, Matt. I'm not saying it is repulsive and offending. Uh, I just I simply point out in that introduction what we do because I um, co-wrote this uh, introduction with um, Oliver Hallish. Um, we merely point out that antinatalism is sometimes regarded as repulsive and offensive. Right. Um, and I don't express any revulsion myself, nor do I feel any. In fact, um, I or we do emphasize that such feelings, uh, if you do have such feelings, are no good reason not to seriously engage with antinatalism. Um, and that antinatalism certainly raises an important question, namely, should we procreate, which is often just assumed to be the case, right? We should, should do it and then we look into the details of uh, procreation um, and talk about that, but no one really seriously doubts that Procreation is a normal and natural thing, and uh, there's an ethical issue there, and that um, that is goes to the um, how shall I say the, the the credit of antinatalism to raise this point in the first place, and and that's what makes it interesting, right? It's a genuinely philosophical inquiry, right? Should should we really procreate? 
Right. And then, so how did you first come across Benatar? Was it just because you work in ethics? I have no idea. I mean, it's, it's difficult not to come across Benatar at, at, at some point, but I can't remember how it happened and when exactly. Okay, thank you. That's a good point. I think his work is becoming sort of all, all pervasive and possible to, to miss at this point. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and you did really write one of the original critiques of, of David Benatar, which we'll get to uh, in a little while. Um, first off though, Michael, why are you not an antinatalist? Why am I not? Well, um, I guess that the arguments put forward by Benatar and others that um, existence is always and by necessity a harm just do not convince me. Um, I mean, of course it can be, life can be horrible. I, I'm more than willing to admit that, but life is very often very much worth living despite the bad things that happen in the world. Um, even though some of those bad things will most likely at some point also happened to, to you, to, to me. I'm, I'm not blind to the evils of existence. It's just that I see also beauty and goodness and that makes it all worthwhile, at least for me and uh, I think for many, many other people as well. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, I, I just wanna say I also, and I, I think Matt may feel the same. I mean, we also see beauty and art and all of these wonderful things I think it just is, doesn't uh, doesn't give reason to start life it, it doesn't it doesn't have enough value to begin the whole story all over again the whole the same keep the whole Shakespeare plays going forever doesn't seem uh, reasonable to, to us you know again you are a transhumanist um, I'd, I'd love it for you to perhaps tell us in your own words what transhumanism is for you um, and perhaps an explanation of why you are in fact a transhumanist Hmm. Um, interesting. Uh, interesting that you ask that question and you're assuming I'm a transhumanist because I'm not. Uh, on the contrary. My apologies. Um, <laughs> most of my work on enhancement of transhumanism has been very critical of transhumanism. Uh, so I'm not a transhumanist uh, for similar reasons why I'm not an uh, antinatalist. Um, transhumanists assume that life is bad and human nature is a disease and to live a good life we need to overcome the human condition we need to do that by changing human nature and becoming something else something better and incorporating uh, technology um, into the human um, into human nature and through doing that becoming something better which doesn't suffer from what we suffer from now. So um, that, that is a transhumanist idea, but um, again, this is a very pessimistic view of life, a view of life that looks at life and like you guys say, well, life sucks and we need to do something about it. And I don't see it that, that way. This is why I'm not a transhumanist at all. Thank you okay. for clarifying that. I didn't realize yeah. that. My apologies. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so in his famous book, uh, Better Never to Have Been, uh, Professor Benatar makes the case for antinatalism from uh, several different normative ethical positions. You know, he tries to cover all the bases. Um, most philosophers tend to use consequentialism or deontology, uh, which is rule-based ethics. Um, I was curious, do you write from a certain normative theory in your own work? And what is your opinion of these you know, it's basically the, the two main popular theories. Yeah, I don't, I don't really have a normative theory in, in, in the background. And, and that is because human morality is very complex and it takes many different shapes and has many different roots. And I don't think they can all be captured by one particular need theory. To, to me, it seems that different theories get different things right and others wrong and especially they get wrong that they um, if they think that they can capture everything so depending on the situation um, the theory leads you in a direction that um, makes you get it wrong but but 
but it is the case that both utilitarianism and uh, deontology get things right. Utilitarianism gets right that consequences matter. They definitely do. We cannot ignore the consequences of our actions. Um, but a Kantian type of de deontology also gets it right that sometimes it is not only the consequences that matter. and We cannot abstract always from the nature of the action. So both matters and we need we need to have some kind of um, um, mixture of the two I would say but not as a full-blown theory. Right? Um, I think that's why I said earlier with Levinas ethics is an optics. You need to look at the situation and certain aspects of the situation um, stick out as morally relevant and you have to find your way in that complex situation and negotiate your way through those aspects. Yeah, thank you for that. I do have a follow up. Um, I'm curious, have you ever heard of this new thing I've been seeing on YouTube a lot called threshold deontology? It's basically where they try to combine consequentialism and deontology using, I mean, I think it's kind of arbitrary, but they're trying to use a, a threshold. So at some point they reach a threshold, then they switch over, to, you know, from deontology to utilitarianism. I was just wondering if you've ever heard of this. No, I haven't. Okay. I need to look into this. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, many antinatalists feel that antinatalism uh, correlates or is, is related with several other social and ethical ideas such as veganism, atheism, and the right to die. In your opinion, do you feel that antinatalism has a connection to any of those things? Um, why or why not? Yeah, sure. I, I can see the connection. I mean, if you think of veganism, um, if vegans, most vegans, um, probably if they're not motivated by health reasons, they're motivated by a concern about animal suffering. So meat eating, as well as the consumption of, of dairy products and eggs, inflict suffering on, on human animals. Um, so if, you, if that's what uh, is your motivation, uh, antinatalists are also motivated by the suffering and by the desire to do something about the suffering that they perceive, right? Uh, and atheism, yeah, as well. I mean, it's, I suppose it would be difficult to be a believer in a, at least a Christian believer in a good God, uh, and at the same time be an antinatalist, because if you're a Christian, you need to believe that God is good and uh, the world as his creation uh, cannot be bad in its essence, must also be good, unless you believe in an evil God, but that's um, a very different um, kettle of fish. And what was the last thing you mentioned, uh, the right to die. Um, sure, if non-existence is indeed better than existence, then it would be monstrous to not allow people to end their lives, so it all fits together. Um, but having said that, um, I'm sure you can be a vegan, an atheist, um, and a defender of the right to die without being an antinatalist. So there's no inconsistency here. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I did want to point out too, there is a, a shocking number of, of Christian antinatalists too. So it does, oh, it does, it does okay. have a, it does go to all these different areas that you wouldn't expect. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for your answer on that. Um, outside of Wikipedia, the word antinatalism is still not included in or defined by any dictionary in the world in any language. Um, I have twice now campaigned to have the word added to the Oxford English Dictionary to no avail. And in addition to this, even the Wikipedia definition keeps changing. So Michael, in your opinion, how do you feel that antinatalism should be defined? Well, I'm not sure why that is that you didn't get the word into a dictionary. Uh, in my view, it certainly deserves uh, recognition. It's increasingly common, both as a movement on attitude, position, and, and the word also is no longer um, a strange or unfamiliar word. So how, how would I define antinatalism? Well, I suppose it's the idea that 
giving birth or more precisely reproducing is morally wrong and we shouldn't do it. Um, and that allows for different reasons why it might be wrong. So different antinatalism, uh, sorry, different antinatalists may have different reasons why they think people shouldn't reproduce. But if you don't think, don't think that people shouldn't reproduce, then you're not an antinatalist. Okay. Uh, in addition to being a philosophical position, antinatalism over the last 10 years or so uh, has also become a developing social movement. And since 2019, antinatalist activism began to develop. And we began to see the emergence of things more akin to traditional activism, uh, like street outreach, meetups, and even the formation of what you could maybe call a proto-NGO, such as Child Free India, Stop Having Kids, Antinatalism International, which is Amanda's Collective, and the AAPJ, which is the Association of Anti-Procreationism in Japan. Um, are you familiar with any of these developments? And either way, how do you feel about the advent of antinatalist activism? Well, I've heard of a few of them, but I can't say I'm very familiar with um, those activist movements. I'm more interested in, in the theory, theory of it than the practice, but it doesn't surprise me because like transhumanism, antinatalism um, is more than just a theoretical standpoint. It is eminently practice oriented. And like transhumanists, antinatalists want to change the world. Am I right? Yes. Correct. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a, you know, I've never really heard trans, the transhumanist movement, you know, spoken of in the same kind of way as the, like the development of the antinatalist movement. So that's a really fascinating perspective. And I, yeah, I think you're right. Um, moving on to some of the papers that you've written about antinatalism, I wanted to briefly ask you about uh, what, if I'm not mistaken, was your very first paper on antinatalism called Benatar and the Harm of Coming into Existence. Um, so you wrote this paper in 2006, the same year as the publication of Better Never to have been uh, making it literally one of probably the very first pieces of criticism that the book uh, ever received. Uh, for the sake of time, I haven't written many questions about this particular paper, but I did want uh, to ask, I mean, did you ever receive any response from Benatar about this particular piece of criticism? And if you could just tell me a little bit about this, this particular work. I'm not entirely sure actually that I wrote this such a long time ago. Are you sure about that? <laughs> I can't remember. I can't say for sure, but it seems to me that it was more recent. In any case, no, I didn't uh, receive any response from uh, David, but that wasn't to be expected because uh, it's not really a proper paper, but just reading notes, uh, which are published on the Academia website. Okay. Um, I was surprised to learn that in 2019, prior to the special Journal of uh, Value Inquiry that you co-produced with Oliver Hallish. Uh, you two had produced a workshop around the subject of antinatalism called David Benatar and the Evil of Existence. Would it be better if we had never been born? Uh, this workshop featured lectures from yourself, Oliver Hallish, Christopher Belshaw, and Emma Sullivan Bissett. What can you tell us about how the idea for this workshop came to be? Oh, that's because Oliver, uh has a very keen interest in antinatalism. And in fact, I think um, a new book by, by um, Oliver is now being published. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's out yet on antinatalism. I believe in German, right? Yes, I, I indeed. Think, it's uh, uh, currently yeah. available on Amazon for pre-order. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he had a very, very strong interest in it. And uh, he came to Liverpool, when was it two, three years ago? Uh, as a visiting professor for a few months. Um, so we were thinking of what we could do together. Uh, and since I also had an interest in antinatalism, we thought we'd do a workshop together. And after the workshop, we thought it would be a shame if um, that should be it. So then we decided to uh, publish a special issue on, on Benatar. Okay, excellent. So aside from the workshop, you and Oliver Halish uh, went on from there to produce this special uh, volume of the Value of Journal Inquiry, volume 56, issue one, uh, the uh, 
called Would It Be Better Never to Have Existed? Uh, David Benatar's Antinatalism. The journal included uh, critiques of antinatalism from yourself, Oliver Halish, uh, Davies Metz, uh, Christine Overall, Nicholas Smythe, uh, Emma Sullivan Bissett, Eric Magnuson, uh, and also there was a reply to all of the criticisms by David Benatar himself. Um, the importance of a work like this, I don't really think can be overstated. I mean, this really marks only the second time in history anything like this has been produced professionally. Uh, and since two, the first time was in 2012, which was the special edition of the South African Journal of Philosophy, Contemporary Antinatalism, featuring Benatar's Better Never to Have Been, which was compiled by Thaddeus Metz at the time. It was his call for papers. Um, Michael, may I ask, were physical copies of this special volume of the Journal of Value Inquiry indeed, you know, printed, you know, physically? Um, is it possible to buy copies? I, I can't tell you how many uh, antinatalists I, I know would love to have a copy of this. Well, I know that printed copies uh, exist because I got one and all the contributors uh, received one, um, but I have no idea uh, how, to, how to get them. I suppose the journal also sells them, but I haven't um, tried to, um, to make sure that this is the case. So I don't know, but since physical copies exist, there must be a way to, to purchase them. Okay, lovely. Um, before I ask you about your specific, you know, paper uh, in, in, in the journal, I mean, is there anything that you'd like to say about any of the articles included? Do you have a favorite one? Do you think that there's one that's most important for antinatalists to check out? Um, well, what can I say? I think they're all important. Otherwise, we wouldn't have included them. And they're not all critical, they're, they're, I mean, they're critical, but not in the sense that they're um, all opposing Benatar's position on antinatalism. But rather, they look at the argument and some try to improve the argument in certain ways. Some look at the implications. Um, I cannot really say that I have a favorite, perhaps the one closest to, to my own views, Christine Overalls, um, because um, she's very much um, looking at her own experience with her children, what it, what it would mean to adopt an antinatalist position, um, what that would mean for one's own relationship to one's children. And I very, very much like the way she used her own uh, personal experience to question the antinatalist approach. But uh, definitely, I think the other papers, uh, Smith is, um, who is looking at um, a certain, what he calls impersonal philosophical temperament that he thinks Benatar um, displays and he compares this to a personal and agent relative approach, which we can find perhaps in, in overall, um, which would, perhaps lead to different results. So I thought it was pretty interesting as well. And Emma Sullivan Bissett um, in her paper, I think if I remember correctly, she draws out the pro uh, mortalist implications of Benatar's view. As you, as you perfectly well know, Benatar denies that um, because of his views um, that that would commit him to also endorse suicide, so ending of one's existence. Um, and uh, Sullivan Bissett denies that he can avoid that, that consequence. And I think uh, with good reason for that. And Eric Magnuson, um, finally, if I, if I remember correctly, he was looking at, um, um, a risk-based argument um, against procreation. So instead of um, insisting like Benatar does that um, life is always bad, so it can never be worth starting. Um, I think he suggests strategically that one should emphasize the risk of one's life being bad. Uh, which would be enough to uh, support the, the antinatalist conclusion. So you can say, because there's always a risk and a significant risk that your life might, uh, might turn out 
um, badly, uh, that is enough to um, weigh the scales against procreation. And again, I thought that was an interesting uh, and um, important take on the question. And Oliver Hollisch uh, is probably the most technical of the papers uh, in the special issue because he deals with, with Benatar's asymmetry argument. So it's a very analytical um, taking apart of that argument, uh, but ultimately supporting the argument. So it, it's, it's very sympathetic of what uh, David is trying to do. Oh, great. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah thank it was, you. It, it was really interesting reading those papers. And that's actually how I discovered your work is because I was looking for responses to better never to have been. And uh, it just it makes me think, you know, while I'm reading these papers, uh, you know, I'm kind of replying to them and taking notes and, uh, you know, it just helps my antenatal arguments um, to read these kinds of papers. And of course, the one that stood out was your paper in the, in the journal. Uh, which was called Antinatalism, Pollyannaism, and Asymmetry, a Defense of Cheery Optimism. So I just want to do, uh, say a quote from it where you say, there is simply no convincing way to measure the quality of someone's life objectively, independent of how they feel about it. So here you're talking about Pollyannaism, um, also known as optimism bias. Uh, what is your opinion on possible objective measures of suffering or quality of life that utilitarians often use, such as you know, the duration, extent, intensity of certain feelings and sensations. Um, you know, these are things that like Jeremy Bentham used to formulate his philosophic calculus. I mean, yes, these are objective features of, of episodes of suffering and episodes of pleasure. And obviously you can compare two or more episodes of pleasure or, two or more episodes of, of pain. One is longer, one shorter, one more intense, uh, one less intense. But what you cannot do is uh, do this kind of thing for, for an entire life. And you cannot easily compare pleasures and pains either. Uh, for instance, there's not necessarily, um, it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one relation in the sense that if there are 10 minutes of suffering uh, that make 10 minutes of pleasure worthless or five minutes of pleasure worthless. Um, there's no objective answer uh, how you should compare these two. It depends on whether you find it worth it. Perhaps a few moments of real happiness can make up for a whole life of misery. So it's not, not as easy and as straightforward as this measuring exercise might suggest right yeah it's i mean it's yeah it's it's a, our ethics even though utilitarians try to make it into a math problem i can see there are sometimes difficulties with that um what do you think of can, can we use things like survey data that show you know there are high amounts of drug and alcohol abuse in developed countries like where you and i live the united states and united kingdom um could we use this data as a way to measure the misery of a population um can this be a measure of the misery of the population? Um, I'm not sure I understand the, the, the question. Oh yeah, I'm just trying to find ways to, because your view is that um, it's really the, the sufferer, their subjective experience that is important to you for quality of life. And I'm just saying, are there things that we can see, like, okay, we can see there's a high amount of you know, alcoholism, say in, in a certain country or something, um, we say, okay, well, they can't be that happy if they're, if they're drinking so much, you know, you know, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, of, of course, of course, there's a correlation between what we do and how we live and how happy we are, right? But um, if you have someone who, I don't know, is on drugs or drinks a lot of alcohol and is very happy with their life, um, then to say their life is worthless or not worth living, that doesn't make much sense to me, right? So the quality of life is, our quality of life is of course affected by how we live very often. But from that you cannot infer that um, the objective features of your life condition the quality of your life. It is a factor. And in, in many cases, it will 
to affect how you feel about your life, but it doesn't have to be the, the case. Okay, thanks. Uh, I just want to quote one more time for your paper, where you say, quote, optimism is in fact justified because every suffering can be turned into a human achievement, every instance of guilt into an opportunity to change oneself, and life's transitoriness into an incentive to take responsible action. Suffering, then, is nothing to be unhappy about because it reminds and challenges us to make the best possible use of each moment of our lives. Um, and I just wanted to quote another antenatal philosopher named Mendham who said, he answered this kind of uh, point. He said, yes, sometimes pain can be needed, a needed wake-up call, but migraine headaches, headaches don't necessarily make someone into a great thinker, end quote. So can you really say that things that all suffering, such as say childhood leukemia, offers some kind of lesson uh, for every kid who suffers and dies from it. Um, would you agree that there is some suffering that has no utility? Yeah, sure. Um, but uh, even though I did write what you just quoted, when I did, I did not intend to express my own view on the matter. I was in fact paraphrasing, paraphrasing Viktor Frankl, if I remember correctly in what he says in his account of the time he spent in a German concentration camp. And Frankl talks about what he calls tragic optimism, which allows us to make the best of any given situation, uh, however bad it may be. And there's always, that is Frankl's view, there's always something to be valued. And the point I was making when discussing Frankl was merely that it's by no means obvious that Frankl, by holding that view, is suffering from an optimism bias. Of course, it is correct that not every, every suffering is useful uh, or that every suffering is good for something. But that is not really, I think, what Frankl is saying. He is talking about uh, human resilience, about our ability to find things that provide hope and solace, even in situations that are indeed very bad. And while that has something to do with our attitude to our own suffering, that doesn't mean it is merely an illusion. Nietzsche once wrote that um, it is not suffering in itself that we mind so much and that we try to avoid, but meaningless suffering. And what Frankel adds to this, I think, is that whether suffering is meaningful or meaningless is not just a matter of objective fact, but also a matter of what we decide to do with it and how, how we decide to approach it. So, sorry, Matt, can you repeat the second criticism? Yeah, sure, that there are chronic pains, but not chronic pleasures. <clears throat> well, I was talk talking about that, you know, it's an asymmetry question. <clears throat> yeah. True, but it's the um, same response. There might be, but you don't have to have chronic pains. Uh, and even if you do, then the multi multitude of pleasures uh, might compensate for the chronic pain. Okay, and then Benatar's third point is injury can be instant, but recovery never is. Again, same point. What, what, what is the relevance? Yet it can be. Mm. Okay. Well, I mean, I could, we could continue and on also, there. Also, you might say, I mean, pleasures and happiness can also be instant um, and um, decline and um, pain can also gradually develop. So, <laughs> we. <laughs> We take certain examples, we, certain, we take certain concrete events in a person's life and say, look how horrible this is. And I would be the last to, to deny the horribleness of certain things that can happen to people. It's just that I don't see that um, it's necessary. Um, most people's lives are not like that. Um, and like I said, I said, said that before, and I know it doesn't convince you <laughs> uh, that there's so much life can also offer, and even though it may indeed suck, 
life, it doesn't always. Um, Michael, do you consider yourself an, an anti-realist or subjectivist? Uh, what do you think about ethical nihilism? Uh, we were just curious, and we were also curious on your views of, on, on, on meta-ethics. Metaphysics. And, uh, you know. As I said before, I, I find it very hard to commit to a certain theoretical outlook. Um, I'm not. I'm not a realist. I'm not a moral realist. Uh, I, I. I cannot make sense of a claim that there are objective values out there or moral facts out there. Um, I cannot make sense of it because I don't see how we could ever um, verify the existence of such facts. Um, so we would have to have a situation, the situation would have to be possible in which something is, is valuable, objectively valuable, uh, even though nobody values it, right? Nobody gives a shit about it, but it's valuable. Um, then we, it would make no sense to, to say that. Um, there needs to be some connection to what we value. Otherwise, it's not a value for us. And a moral fact, what might this moral fact be? Say, I don't know, abortion. Abortion is morally wrong. Can that be a moral fact out there? It's much too... As I said, said earlier, there are so many different sources of morality, and they all have to do with who we are, what kind of being we are, but also who we are as individuals and what kind of society we live in. And it's, it's a ne negotiation and it's an attempt, it's part of the attempt to, to live well morality. But to say there are those facts and we can discover those facts that just lead, leads to um, uh, dogmatism and intolerance, and I don't like that at all. But on, on the other hand, I wouldn't say I'm a nihilist. I wouldn't say nothing, nothing matters um, because things matter, matter to us, right? Um, but we can't go, get beyond that. So if the idea is that things can only matter to us if they matter, full stop objectively, then I don't see it. If, if that is your view, then nothing matters, but they keep mattering to us. And that's all we can ever have. The mattering as such, the mattering objectively is, if it exists, completely inaccessible. All we have is what matters to us. And it might be that what matters to me is different from matters to you, but um, we can talk about this. We can try to figure out what it is that, that concerns you and why certain things are important to you. And since we are both human and we have certain common backgrounds, evolutionary backgrounds, biological backgrounds, but also social backgrounds, there will most likely be some commonalities, some, some overlap, some possibility of communicating with each other and understanding each other. Um, and that's all we have, will ever have. So I'm not a moral objectivist or realist, but also not, not a nihilist. I'm something in between, but I can't tell you, I can't give you a name for it. It, towards the end of your paper, you make um, some claims about promortalism, which is a, is a subject that's increasingly coming up, you know, within the antinatalist world. Um, and it, can you perhaps uh, um, tell me how you define it, uh, promortalism, first of all? Promortalism. Um, so I would say it's a view that death is good, is welcome. Um, and the question is whether antinatalism has to also commit to promortalism. Um, and Benatar clearly 
uh, argues against that. Uh, he doesn't want to accept pro mortalist implications um, of uh, antinatalism. Emma Sullivan Bissett thinks he's wrong. Um, I think he's wrong too for reasons I explained earlier. Can you explain a little bit more about why you think antinatalism leads to promortalism? Well, if not being is better than being, then it seems to me, and it doesn't matter whether it's behind us or um, in, in front of us. Um, now, usually, I think that um, Epicurus' argument against the evil of death or against the claim that death is a harm is pretty convincing. So the idea that um, once we are dead, we are no longer able to suffer any harm from anything, let alone from our being dead. Uh, and if we think that we are harmed by being dead, we are falling victim to a certain confusion. We are imagining ourselves to still be there and experiencing our own death which obviously um, is not going to be the case. So um, Epicurus's um, concern was to um, help us get rid of the fear of death. So there's nothing to fear here, death cannot harm you and so on. Now there is possibility and of course very few people are and few philosophers are willing to accept this. Uh, so modern philosophers have uh, develop theories uh, that are meant to show that death can be a harm, even though it's not a harm to the one who's dead, it's a harm to the one who used to be alive. Um, and um, that requires, um, it seems to me that this requires seeing certain goods in life that you might still experience if you had stayed alive. So the argument would be, yes, once you're dead, you cannot experience anything. But uh, while you're alive, there are certain things you want to do, certain goods that you might still um, enjoy in the future. And this is all cut short, right? You, you, you are prevented from accessing those goods that the future might still hold for you. That is the most common uh, argument against Epicurus or why death can still be a harm for us. Um, but this option is not open to the anti-natalist or at least not to Benatar because um, he denies that life is good or that anything might come that might make life worth having in the first place. So if it's not worth having in the first place, then there's no reason why I shouldn't end my life right now. Um, and uh, as I said earlier, if, if um, and, and <clears throat> Benatar in fact um, emphasizes the uh, annihilation itself as an evil. But annihilation means well, the ending of existence and the transition to the stage of non-existence. So it's not about the goods I'm going to miss out on. It's not about the, the harm that is death in, in itself, but it's about annihilation, the specter of annihilation. But surely for an antinatalist, there cannot be a specter, there cannot be anything frightening because that is what the antinatalist claims is so much better than existence. It is non-existence nothing else. So, and, and if it is a certain bias we have, a certain fear, then surely we should overcome that fear and take the consequence, draw the conclusion of our belief that non-existence is preferable to, to existence. So I just don't, don't get the argument. Okay, thank you so much for that. The whole question of pro-mortalism in antinatalism is a, it's a complicated one from our perspectives. Um, and again, I think a lot of it does depend on how it's defined and also what's being included within that definition. There's sometimes a, 
a feeling that that I have anyway that th there's a whole lot that's being sort of smuggled into that definition where um, you know there are in fact a, a great many now antinatalists who do identify as promortalists. Um, the vast majority of them, however, I would say, are more identified with it being a, an idea that has you know it's an attitude towards suicide or the right to die rather than than murder, which is sometimes the the implication. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, does it does it do you feel that it relates just to ideas of ending one's life or ending all life? I mean, do you think that it it has an implication towards ending other people's lives as opposed to decisions we make for ourselves? You mean whether anti-natalism would commit me to a certain whether pro whether promortalism would include not only attitude attitudes towards suicide but um also you, you know does it does it imply that we should end other people's lives i suppose i suppose i suppose it would imply that yes um because i mean not 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 necessarily individual people, but as Benata himself suggests, uh, it would be better for us to go extinct rather earlier rather than later. Um, and that is, of course, because we're assuming that there's more suffering in someone's life, no matter how good their life is, there's always more suffering than happiness. Um, and uh, however much happiness there is, it never makes that life worth having in the first place. Um, and then, of course, I could justify my killing other people by saying I'm just saving them from the suffering that they will otherwise experience. Obviously, I would have to do this in the most compassionate way, preferably so that they are not frightened and they don't know what's happening uh, but i'm preventing all this suffering from happening yeah regarding the question of antinatalism being promortalist in the sense of leading us directly to killing everyone um there is in a sense two answers to this uh the first answer would be no it does not uh, what antinatalists want to do is prevent life uh, we actively argue that people should not start lives and I think the vast majority of antinatalists would agree with this. Um, on the other hand, some antinatalists, especially negative utilitarians, do champion a version of the benevolent world exploder uh, thought experiment and do believe that if it was real, pressing it would be the uh, ethical thing to do. Um, do you believe that something like the benevolent world exploder is the same as promortalism? Well, that was a, is what I was just suggesting in my reflections, but I'm not committed to it. I'm sure there are ways out of this. And as you rightly say, uh, antinatalists usually are against starting life. And that doesn't mean that they're also for ending life, whether it's one's own life or someone else's, but I'm questioning whether that is really consistent. Um, and I don't see the, the consistency. It seems to me like a cop-out. If you really, really, really believe that non-existence is better than existence, why are you still here? Yeah, I think there's a, like a couple of responses to that. Um, you know, one would be that we don't really have a, a good way to kill ourselves you know we don't have e easy access to doctors just to suicide or suicide pills or anything so making it um you know nice and easy for people is very difficult at this point um and then the other point which the philosopher in mendham often mentions is that uh we really need more activists we need to prevent other people from coming into existence so he always says well, even if I'm dead, I'm actually still here because a new me is being born every minute. Uh, so we kind of need her to be here to spread, uh, you know, help, help get a right to die for one thing and help prevent new people from coming into existence. <laughs> yeah, okay. 
Good. Uh, as I said, you can also f always find justifications, but f f to me that suggests that you're not, I mean, not talking about you, that the anti-natalist who, who finds those reasons for why they should not end their lives, um, they, they're looking for a justification. Um, and I mean, the, the if you will, the second reason you gave, we need to be here in order to make sure. Um, I haven't heard that before, um, but it's an interesting reason which reminds me of Schopenhauer. Um, Schopenhauer um, also thought that suicide is not a way out. He shared many of the assumptions of antinatalism, his horrible life um, and so on. So the best, thing that we can hope for is the annihilation of the will which we cannot achieve through death let alone through suicide because through suicide we just affirm the will we are unhappy with the way the world has treated us but we're still affirming the will um, but uh, and we will be reborn we will still be there because uh, it's an illusion to think that we are different from everyone else. Um, so Sue Schopenhauer would precisely agree with that, not quite with the same reasoning that we have to be still around in order to convince others of the uh, truth of antinatalism, but rather because we just won't be gone. And you, you hinted at something like that. So um, fair enough, I'm happy to accept that. But the first reason you gave there's no nice and easy way um, to kill yourself. Yeah, sure, but who says it has to be nice and easy? If life is such a horrible thing and um, there's no chance of it getting any better, why does it have to be life and easy? If it, even if it's difficult, it's still worth doing it to prevent the suffering that you otherwise will have to, um, expect. Now, I really don't want to persuade you guys to commit suicide. It just, it always strikes me as a certain inconsistency. If you really believed it, you wouldn't be here anymore. So there must be something that you still think is worth doing or worth having in this life, what? even if it's only to convince other people of the truth of antinatalism. That at least must be worth doing. It must be worth being here for. Well, if, if I thought that ending my own life would cure the problem, then I think it would probably be worth doing under you know any circumstance. It'd be worth doing in horrible pain because then there'd be I'd be leaving nothing behind that would be suffering. You know, there'd be there'd be no uh, sentient creatures, you know, behind and, you know, live out the same experience that, you know, I have to draw the same conclusions I did, but ending my life doesn't fix the problem. It may fix my problem. <laughs> it may, it may end my suffering, but it doesn't end suffering. Um, and so, you know, the antinatalist conclusion is, is, is not simply a, uh, a, a, a conclusion about one's own life. It's about, you know, a, a, a it's a product review of life itself, essentially. So yeah. understand yeah. it's it's a moral conviction. Yeah. It's not not being fed up with one's own life, but rather it's about the moral conviction that exactly that suffering resulting from from existence is bad and needs to be addressed. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. Uh, in the second half of your paper, you attack Benatar's most well-known argument, the axiological asymmetry. Uh, can you? first describe how you see Professor Benatar's argument and why you believe it to be false? Well, the axiological symmetry is that, um, that the absence of pleasure is not bad unless there's someone who's deprived of that pleasure. Correct. Whereas the presence of pain, no, the absence of pain is good even though there's nobody right. who is not in pain because they've never been born, they've never been conceived. And 
Uh, I think David bases this on common intuition, namely that um, it's wrong to willingly bring a child into the world that uh, has some kind of severe disability and whose life predictably will contain a lot of suffering. Um, whereas we don't feel we have a moral obligation to bring people into the world, new people into the world that have a happy life. So there's a certain asymmetry here, but I don't see the asymmetry because um, there is there's something in between a moral obligation to do something and a moral obligation not to do something, namely indifference, the, um, that something is allowed, that something is permissible. So obligation to do versus an obligation not to do between those two is a permission to do something. And um, there would be an, an, an asymmetry if um, we would say we should not bring a being into the world that suffers, um, but sorry, I'm getting a bit confused here uh, through the argument as well. Yeah, that's okay. Please, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that uh, it is neither the case that we are morally obligated to bring children into the world, um, nor are we morally obligated not to do that under certain conditions. What is the case is that we are, we are permitted to do so unless we know that the child is going to suffer quite a lot. And the reason that is so is that the child that is going to suffer is a child that is going to exist. So we're not talking about the suffering of possible people, we're talking about the suffering of actual people. They don't exist yet, but they will exist if we bring them into the world. That is why we have that obligation to consider the suffering that they might experience if we bring them into the world. Whereas we don't have an obligation to possible people, meaning to bring them into the world just because they would or might have a happy life. Those people don't exist. We cannot have any obligations to them. So there's not really an asymmetry. So I hope I managed now to explain this a bit better. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to talk briefly about misconceived why these further criticisms of antinatalism fail a critique of cheery optimism, a response to Michael Hoskeller. Uh, this was, of course, um, Benatar's response to you. Um, I mean, just, you know, what do you think of his critique back to you? A lot of, you know, a lot of his critiques um, or his, his thoughts on a lot of the papers were really interesting. I mean, you know, um, I have to say, I mean, you know, this did mark the first time where he did um, agree that there is a coral. I mean, not to your paper, but with with Emma Sullivan dissent. I mean, he did actually for the first time agree that there's a correlation between uh, some antinatalism and promortalism. Like if you're, uh, I think I think if you said if you're coming from an Epicurean point of view, then yes, it could. I mean, that was that that happened for the first time within uh, this this response paper. Um, so there's a lot of really good stuff um, within this within this response, I think. Uh, but what did you think about the response in general to all the papers that he wrote uh, in this thing? And then, and what did you think about his response to you? Well, I can't say so much about David's responses to the other papers. In general, my impression was that he didn't take. Um, the objections too seriously. So basically defended his argument and his view, but he didn't really make many concessions as in his responses. Uh, and David's response to my own paper, it seems to me that it didn't really address the problem as I see it, which is the claim that we as a rule seriously overestimate the quality of our lives. So that's what he's saying, um, which I think is not supported by the empirical studies that he cites. 
Um, it is also not the case that if I'm right that you cannot assess the quality of someone's life or more precisely whether the life was worth starting independently of their own subjective assessment, it would follow we have no reason to relieve disability or disease or to alleviate poverty. That's what, what, what he claims in his response. Um, I don't think that follows because certain diseases and extreme poverty, uh, as, I, as I alluded to um, or indicated earlier, uh, they do in fact affect our subjective well-being. Um, so it's not that there's no correlation between objective features of the world in which we find ourselves and our subjective well-being. Of course, we are affected by it. And it would be very odd if there weren't such a correlation. But the point is, my point is that most people's lives are not like that. Um, and it is those people David is talking about when he says they vastly overestimate the quality of their lives to the extent that their lives appear worth starting to them, but in fact they were. So we're not talking about people who suffer from, from extreme poverty or terrible disease. We're talking about people who think they have a good life. And David is saying, no, they don't. <laughs> you only think you have a good life. But if you look closely, all the little things that add up and make your life actually miserable, even though you're not aware of it. And that is the argument that I'm um, objecting to, that you can say, my life is a good one. And someone else comes along and says, no, it isn't. <laughs> your life is not a good one because I don't know, you have to go to the loo three times a day and you're hungry and uh, you get tired and all these things that David mentions. And it doesn't seem to me that most people are very bothered by this. And if they're not very bothered by this, then it's not really a problem. It doesn't affect the quality of their lives. Do you, how can I ask this question? Like, are you at all, I mean, you know, good lives, never exist in a vacuum away from the bad lives. Like with the role of the dice of procreation, you're always gonna get some good lives and some bad lives. And does, I mean, does that, do you think that the fact that the, the good lives cannot exist without the bad ones, I mean, does that sully the good? in any kind of way? I mean, that there's no, there's, no, there's no getting away from the fact that the goods come at the cost of the really bad and that there's no way currently we have to edit out that bad. So your, your, your life, your good life is always gonna come at the cost of the, of, of the horror. Mm -hmm. um, it's an in interesting question. I, I don't, don't agree with your assumption. It's an interesting question. It goes back to a thought experiment by William James in, in one of his papers about a world in which the happiness of everyone is being bought by the suffering of one miserable creature at the edge of the universe. And um, Ursula K. Le Guin, I, I never know how to yes. pronounce the name, in that story, those who escaped from Omphalos, Omf I forgot the exact title. Those who walk away from Omphalos. Yeah, exactly, this one. Um, she has the same scenario, and the question is, is that, would that be, would, would that be morally acceptable to do that? And of course, from a utilitarian point of view, you would have to say, yes, absolutely, right? Should this one creature suffering uh, and so much ha uh, happiness is being bought through that, but there seems to be something deeply disturbing um, and wrong about this scenario. However, I don't think that is the case. It's not that just because some people are lucky and have a good life, that is being uh, necessarily bought by someone else's misery. So I don't think the world is such that we cannot all be relatively happy. 
it's not that we rely on other people's misery to uh, be happy. It might be that in fact, the world as its structure now um, very much um, um, it, it is a world in which not everyone has the resources to live a decent life. Um, but that doesn't mean that this is a kind of metaphysical necessity. We could structure the world differently and perhaps we should all work towards the world being structured differently. And by the world, I don't mean the natural world, I mean society, the world we humans organize and how we live together. So I don't, I, I, I would accept that if it were the case that our, we can only be happy if others are miserable, then there's a moral problem and we should think about whether that we can justify that if that is the case. But um, other than, I don't think it is necessary. Oh, oh, thank you for your thoughts on that, thank you. All right, stepping back a moment to ask about an older work of yours. Uh, we we're both intrigued to learn that you had in fact written about Frankenstein, uh, which is a bit of a mascot for the antinatalist world. Um, uh, Mary Shelley's novel Frankenstein is a popular metaphor for natalism. Um, and you wrote a paper called Want to Live Forever? Don't Pull a Frankenstein in 2013, uh, which was basically a transhumanist paper. Why did you decide to write about this story? And uh, how do you feel it relates to transhumanism or antinatalism? Can I ask you a question first? Sure. Um, why, why did you say it's a popular metaphor for natalism? What, what do you mean by that? Ed, yeah, do you want to take this, Amanda? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, so it's it's interesting with Frankenstein because it's it you know it's never really correlated, or a lot of people don't think about it in terms of a metaphor for human procreation or procreation in nature. But it's it so clearly is from an antinatalist perspective um, that every time we procreate, we are essentially creating new Frankensteins. And so as a metaphor, this is something that kind of keeps coming up in antinatalism. Um, I, in 2015, I made a, I made a movie called The Ephilist, which um, uses this metaphor. I like performed Dr. Frankenstein and Frankenstein <laughs> doing some crazy things together. Um, but anyway, I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, again, like the Frankenstein monster is sort of a, a mascot in some respects of, of antinatalism and that he's, um, you know, he's created, uh, you know, he's, he's not procreated the same way people are in reality, but I mean, he's, he's created and he suffers and his suffering comes at this huge cost of this, you know, this biological experiment that his creator just uh, feels he has a right to perform. Yeah, okay. uh, yeah, and, it, and I just want to say it, it ties into also to uh, something we didn't really t touch on, but Benatar's misanthropic argument, which is also when you yeah. procreate, your creation could do great damage in the world. Yeah, okay, I get it. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, well, to answer your question, what, why I was interested in that, well, Victor Frankenstein is a scientist with enlightenment ideas, and I'm talking about uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, um, and he basically wants to make the world a better place and do that mostly by ridding the world of what he thinks is the greatest evil, namely death. Um, and focusing on this particular goal is something, he, he becomes something like a proto-transhumanist, and yet he creates a monster. So the question is, what went wrong, if there is something that went wrong. And the way it is being described in the novel, um, there is a problem with um, Frankenstein trying to force nature to reveal its secret. So it's a kind of rape fantasy, the way he talks about um, nature and unlocking nature's secrets. Um, and it's also clear that Frankenstein wants to be like like God, so om Omni power is very much a fantasy of Frankenstein's. And it seems that the novel, um, the novel presents what happens in the aftermath of his creation of the monster 
uh, as a punishment, a just punishment for uh, Frankenstein's hubris, for his transgression. So there's a certain danger that's being emphasized that we are not gods and as human beings, we are likely to screw up if we try to do something that only gods should be trying to do. Uh, at least that is the traditional reading and probably the reading that, that Mary Shelley um, would support most. Okay, yeah, I'd just like to read a quote from your paper. Uh, quote, his accursed, unfeeling, heartless creator has abandoned him for no good reason. And he had no right to do that because a creator has a moral obligation to look after his creation. We cannot give life to a being that can think and feel and suffer and then just leave it to fend for itself. Instead, we have a duty to make sure that it gets what it needs, not only to survive, but also to live well, end quote. Um, do you think this statement could be convincing from the antenatalist perspective? Uh, after all, parents accept the fact that they will abandon their children at some point by dying. No matter how much affection or training they give their child, they will impose loneliness, fear, and sorrow upon them without their consent. So it seems that all procreators can be seen as Dr. Frankenstein's with their own selfish agendas and dreams of glory. Um, just wondering if you've, if you thought about that, maybe when you're writing the paper uh, about procreation at all, uh, and what you think of that ana analysis. Hmm, it's interesting. Now I can see the connection to, to antinatalism. Um, sure, there's, a, there's an alternative reading um, to, to the one I just, described earlier as a traditional one, um, which I also um, point out um, and uh, look into in the, in the paper you mentioned. Uh, namely, you can read it from a transhumanist perspective, uh, in which case it is not Dr. Frankenstein who represents humanity and then does something that only gods should be doing, but it is Frankenstein's monster who represents humanity. And then the creature is unjustly abandoned by its creator. Uh, the subtitle, as you know, of the book is um, Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. And the modern Prometheus um, is then, um, um, it's, it's unclear who is a modern Prometheus. Is it Dr. Frankenstein or is it the, the creature that, that he creates? Um, and if we see the, the Frankenstein's creation, the monster, who is not really very much a monster because it is actually quite kind and like a child at the beginning. And it is rather because he's being treated very badly by the people um, he meets and of course also by his creator that he swears revenge and becomes evil, but he's not really a monster at all. But anyway, so if we see um, the monster as representing humanity, then the reading changes completely. So it is a position of the child that is being abandoned. And you made that connection, uh, Matt, is not any child in relation to its parents, just like Frankenstein's monster is uh, in relation to uh, Frankenstein, but it seems to me that the analogy doesn't quite work because um, clearly some parents do abandon, abandon their children, but normally parents see to it that their children get everything they need to do well before they let them go and they don't abandon their children, they abandon them when they're grown up, which makes a huge difference uh, in my view. Uh, also, um, it is not the case that parents are necessarily motivated by a selfish agenda or dreams of glory as, as clearly Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein is in the book. Um, there are many different motivations people have to, to have children. Often it, it is love. It's the impulse to share your life with someone. Now, it may be the case that this is misguided. Perhaps you're right that we shouldn't be doing it, but um, that doesn't mean that they had a bad motivation. So you can you can think that the motivation is misguided or the, the act 
that follows their motivation as misguided without vilifying their, their motivation. Okay, thank you for that. All right, thank you so much. Yeah, those are great, 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 uh, great thoughts there. Um, uh, so just a couple, just a couple of ending questions. Um, uh, Michael, what are you currently uh, working on, uh, if anything, and do you think that antinatalism will continue to be a part of your work at all moving forward? Well, uh, as I indicated earlier, currently I'm trying to understand meaning in life. So what it means to live a meaningful life. And I'm working on a new book, uh, which is working title is Analysis, the Analysis of Meaning, um, in which I am trying to defend the subjectivist position about meaning in life. Um, it would probably go to far now to, to explain how, uh, where I sent there exactly, but very briefly, subjectivist position means that anyone can live a meaningful life. Even non-human animals can live meaningful lives. Um, whereas the tendency in the analytical philosophical discussion of meaning is to um, claim that meaning is the exception rather than the rule. So you need to do great things like being Mother Teresa or Picasso or Einstein in order to live a meaningful life. Um, and it is clear for most philosophers writing on the subject that non-human animals, for instance, never have a meaningful life. And I disagree with that. I'm trying to spell out um, how um, meaning can be even in those lives that appear not particularly significant to most people. Now, the question about antinatalism will it continue to be part of my work. I really devote a chapter in this book to antinatalism because it's relevant to a certain position regarding whether uh, life is meaningful or not. And Benatar, in his, uh, in his last book, clearly um, draws a connection to meaning and makes the additional argument, as you know, that since there's no cosmic meaning, uh, the universe doesn't care whether we live or die or what happens to us, that is an additional reason for why life is not worth living or worth starting. Um, and that fits very well into the general um, tendency of the discussion to look at those objective features of human life and uh, infer from them that our life is not really, cannot possibly be meaningful. And even though I agree with the premises, I don't think there is something in the universe that cares. I'm, I'm an atheist myself. Um, but it seems to me that that doesn't matter. I don't care what the universe thinks. I don't need the universe to care for me in order for things to matter to me. And their mattering to me is what creates meaning in my life. But we'll see how it works out whether there's um, space for antinatalism, I think there will be. Oh, great, great Excellent. to hear. Yeah, um, so many of your papers are available online uh, and they're in the public domain, so thank you for that. Um, how can people best support your works? Well, reading the stuff that is out, out there would be a good start and buy my books. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. Uh, well. First off, I want to take a moment to thank Life Sucks Matt for being my co-host today. Matt, it's always an honor. Thank you so much, my friend, uh, for being my co-host today. This was great. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, and thank you so much, Michael, uh, for being our guest today on the Exploring Antinatalism podcast. Uh, thank you for coming back and doing this all over again. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, it's been a pleasure to, uh, to meet you and to speak with you about your work. Uh, thank you for all that you've produced. Well, thank you both very much, Amanda and Matt, for inviting me. It's been a pleasure talking. Good. Thank you. You can find links to all papers by Professor House Keller discussed in this episode in our description, as well as a link to Amazon.com where you can purchase many of his books. Please also subscribe to Life Sucks on YouTube, check out his Etsy shop, and make sure to pick up your copy of the ABCs of Antinatalism Coloring book today.
Thank you for listening to the Exploring Antinatalism podcast. This has been Amanda Oldfan Sukunik. You can find me on the YouTube channel, Antinatal Wolf. Keep up with my daily antinatalist news updates at Antinatal News on Twitter. Please follow the podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. You can listen to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Buzzsprout, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Amazon.com, RSS Feed, and so many other platforms. Email me at exploringantinatalism at gmail.com. The podcast website, www.exploringantinatalism.com, was designed by the amazing Visions Noirs. Please follow him at www.bionoir.com and also follow him on Instagram. Logo art by the amazing Life Sucks. Subscribe to him on YouTube and check out his merch at www.etsy.com slash shop slash Life Sucks Publishing. Music by the wonderful I Doubt It. Subscribe to him on YouTube. And check out our collaborative project along with our friend Ethel WV, The Right to No Longer Exist, which includes the podcast, The Right to No Longer Exist, A Right to Die podcast. All the best, and bye for now.